And so welcome everyone to this um, webinar hosted by INEE on policy practice and measurement of life skills and values in East Africa. So my name is Rachel Smith. I am the coordinator for psychosocial support and social and emotional learning at INEE. And I'm here today just in the capacity of moderator. I'm going to be handing over shortly to our presenters um, who are from the ALIVE initiative. So the ALIVE team, that's assessment of life skills and values in East Africa. And um, today our session is going to give participants the opportunity to hear about the milestones of the ALIVE initiative and to hear the findings of the national assessment for the four jurisdictions, which are Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zanzibar, and to hear lessons from East Africa on the assessment of life skills and values. And then towards the end of the session, we will have an opportunity for a Q&A. If you have any questions throughout, please just pop them in the chat. As I mentioned, we're using the meeting function today, so we can see everyone on the call, which is absolutely wonderful, and I love it. Um, but just to be aware that during presentations, if you can make sure that you are on mute um, and you can have your camera on or off, it's up to you. Um, but please do share questions and comments um, in the chat throughout the session. And then we'll probably do a kind of hands up um, towards the end um, if you have any, any additional questions. So today we will be hearing from um, members of the ALIVE team. Um, I think I'll be handing over to uh, Purity first of all. Um, Purity is the evidence manager at Pazizi Afrique Foundation and she's the ALIVE co-lead in Kenya. We're also going to be hearing from Dr. Maro Giacomazzi who is from the institutional, uh, he's the institutional development advisor of the Luigi Giussani Institute of Higher Education. And we will also be hearing from Devota Malay, who's um, working on advocacy with um, the ALIVE initiative. And I hope if his internet's working, we will also hear from Dr. John Mugo, who is the executive director of the ZZ Afrique Foundation, um, of ZZ Afrique and the principal investigator of the ALIVE initiative. So I believe I'm handing over to you first, Purity, is that right? Yes, yes. Wonderful. And uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Rachel, and uh, thanks to all the members who have joined us. I hope you can hear me. I am here in Kenya, and I, I belong to this team of a life assessment of values and life skills. Uh, and uh, I'm going to make this presentation um, uh, on behalf of the whole team. is a collaborative of so many organizations working together that was formed to really bring everyone and every voice together because most of the time you realize in this space, sometimes we are doing the same thing, but in a very disjointed way. And we wanted to really form a group of people who have things they're doing alike and they're interested in the education space and to have our children acquire competencies for learning and for driving. And uh, so the regional education initiative have been in existence. It has 70 organizations and really with three key main agenda. First is to build knowledge because you cannot grow capacity without evidence, without bringing people together to share and to learn. And we also want to influence policy in our own uh, way, in especially in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Uh, the education system and, and the political will has given us that opportunity to really uh, use our evidence to advocate uh, for change and to have our children learning, and also to transform members and to transform organization. And in really, it has three thematic cluster, and this group of assessment of life skills and value sit. Uh, on the values and life skills cluster that has 25 organizations. And these organizations in 2018, when they came together, they had three questions. One is, what are these competencies that everyone is talking about? You know, everyone is seeing social emotional learning, others are called, to, talking about soft skills, transferable skills, what are they? How, how, where do we draw the line? What are the boundaries? Are we talking about the same thing? Then they, want to under, they wanted to understand, and in that time, 
And even now, the education system in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania has been changing to accommodate uh, these core competencies, as we call, uh, call them, or life skills and values. And so it was very important for that to be one of the questions explored. Uh, and then how can we measure them? So how can you know that any person has these competencies um, that everyone is saying they are very important in this world, in this 21st century, they're important for learners, they're important for job, and everyone needs them. And how can we nurture them? Because if there are gaps then, if people don't have them and they can't get opportunity later, how can we support whether in our own small way uh, or also support the, the education system in nurturing these competencies? And for the first two and a half years, we have been working on the first two. One is understanding the competencies and the other one is developing a contextualized assessment. And this is inspired by the WESO uh, assessment. Most of the people who, are really part of the alive who are doing um, assessment for foundational competencies. And this was citizen led ground up localization process where the people really understand the problem and, and they develop measures that can help you know, identify the gap and put pressure on either uh, the people involved. Uh, but what we, we have seen also is that there are very limited assessment metrics, whether it is globally, or even in our context, especially those ones that are dealing with uh, social emotional um, competencies, most of them actually are quite, um, you know, not for our context coming from the north, from the west, and sometimes we, we pick them. But this time, this team of people wanted to build something for East African children, something where the children have a voice in it, uh, something that is observable in our context. Because when you talk about maybe, for example, problem solving in your context, in our context, it would be something uh, probably different. Maybe we are talking about what you, you refer to collaborative problem solving, but in our context, we call it problem solving. So we wanted really to build something for us, to build something that has a different approach to it in terms of um, the assessment process and, and, and all that. And um, of course, um, uh, recognizing that even those uh, most assessments saying that they are coming from the global north doesn't mean that we are not learning from those assessments. It means that, yes, we are recognizing that they are not really contextual, but they are lessons for us to learn. But the most important thing that has been happening now is that the government has been keen on, you know, um, integrating these values and life skills and national curriculum. And so we also took advantage of that to really uh, build the momentum together. Um, and in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, I've mentioned that there's so much happening, especially political will, the education systems have changed. If you, if you look into, like in Kenya, we already have the new um, uh, curriculum, competence-based curriculum that have been in existence for seven years. Uh, Uganda, Tanzania, there's also talks and, and, and many decisions have been made to ensure that they also uh, get to the level where they have new curriculum that incorporate uh, 21st century skills. So this group um, of ally and the project had three uh, main areas, I would say. One is to develop contextualized tools. This has been a household assessment. Uh, the tools will be open sourced this much so everybody can, can use the tool um, and use them for what for assessing adolescents uh, 13 to 17 and use the evidence to really advocate for, for, for change in the, in the system, but also to create awareness. One of the things is that people are yet to understand why are these things important? And even when you hear parents who are still more on the high stake exams and foundational competencies, as we know them of technical skills and literacy and maths, is because they are yet to understand the importance of these things. And we want to be that voice to create more awareness, to tell them what they, they can achieve, but also you cannot be a voice if your capacity is not enhanced. So we have been trying to do everything as a learning academy where members come together and learn how to develop measurements, how to understand them, how to contextualize them. And so Alive has been very keen in the process of con contextualizing. We first started this process, as I mentioned, in 2018 by having those three questions. Then we prioritized competencies. I mean, this is a very broad area. We went and zoomed in and picked one in every domain. So we have problem solving in that cognitive. Uh, we have self-awareness in the self-domain and we have collaboration you know, in the social. But we also wanted to uh, you know, assess value, uh, values and we picked respect. Uh, and then we conducted uh, an ethnographic study in 15 district targeting uh, adolescents, parents, teachers to know, the, to know how they understand these things. Even telling 
asking them to tell us what they call these things in their mother tongue. So if you say problem solving, how is it called in my own mother tongue? In Kenya, we have over 44 languages. In uh, Uganda, we have over 64 languages. So it was very important for those voices to be also represented. We did a systematic literature review to also for global co you know, comparability. And then we brought a team of 47 experts you know, from East Africa, from government, uh, from the Ministry of Education, those who do assessment to those who develop curriculum we had people even from the, the the music industry you know the artists because they also have a different understanding of these things we had teachers uh, we had parents in this consortium to help us in develop assessment tool but more importantly for them to also build their capacity so that by the end of it all we should not be saying that the tools are coming from the north cannot they also in their own small way continue developing more metrics for different competencies can they support other people to grow their capacity and we drafted the tools we did two pre-tests and one pilot which was helping in the revisions of the tool. When we started, we had so many tasks. And just to mention, I, and I know the brother will talk more about the, how our tasks look like. They are scenario-based, performance-based. So it was very an intense process. And even when this team was developing the metrics, they were also trying to uh, contextualize, you know, their voices, you know, you have 47 people on the same table who have different thoughts, who are bringing all those thoughts, their culture, their religion to this mix. And so the process really of contextualization was not just from the ethnographic study, hearing what Adores have to say, it has been a long process of over 34 weeks, everyday people, you know, changing, sharing, um, arguing, uh, you know, in a very nice way on what need to go there, what need to be removed. And especially when you're thinking about household assessment uh, and, and, and in our context where, I mean, it has been documented that um, the learning outcomes are low. So out of, out of 10 children, you have many who cannot read. So you're also thinking about that uh, so that you don't really assess literacy or reading uh, purporting to measure problem solving or, or self-awareness or collaboration. And so we have achieved as a collaborative because we have a, a tool that is ready. We have assessed uh, 45, over 45,000 adolescents in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we have visited 75 uh, 35,720 homes, you know, talking to parents because before you assess the adolescents, you have to talk to the parent to, to, you know, to create awareness on why this is important. Um, and we have now 47 experts in East Africa, whom we can say with a lot of confidence are able to really support the process of assessment, tool development, integration of these competencies, uh, assessment in the national systems. And we have done a lot of media engagement, uh, just trying to ensure that people within our context understand the importance of this, but also in the global space. Because I mean, if you look at uh, SDG for 4.7, yes, there's a uh, lot of uh, so, uh, social emotional learning that happens there, but we don't have this as one of the indicators of foundational uh, in target 4.1. So how can we build the momentum? Because if we are saying that uh, foundational competencies are just maths and, 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 and reading, what about these social emotional uh, skills that are very important or values and life skills? Um, so um, we have um, um, challenges, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's good to admit, uh, because this has been a very intense process. First is that valid understanding, including even now, when I'm interchanging soft skills, transferable skills, sometimes someone will ask you, and are you still talking about the same thing? Uh, so so we, have, we have had different understanding, not just of the bigger, uh, uh, you know, definition of this uh, domains and all that, but even the specifics, when you talk about self-awareness, when you talk about collaboration, and I think my time is up, um, uh, about, you know, self-reported, uh, we have talked about most of the tool being developed from the North, and that complicate the process of wanting to validate your tool, because you need a tool that then is comparable, is contextual, um, and, and all that process. And uh, so let me invite the brother and I'll allow her to share the screen from her end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Purity, for that thorough um, presentation. And um, I'm going to take it from where she has 
um, left. My name, as uh, Rachel said, is Devotam Lai, and I'm connecting from um, Kilimanjaro, Tanzania. And I'm going to take you through the methodology that um, we have used as a life to our school and also like, um, you know, how we did um, the assessment, the methodology that we used to do this journey that we took. And the only thing that I want to add is that um, each, um, each stage that you are seeing on the screen, for example, we started with contextualization study, context be one of our key main uh, drive to make sure that whatever we are doing is, is uh, responding to the context that we are. And after we did like build the, the, the consensus on like the skills that you want to do and you know how the skill should be like, we borrowed a lot of information from the study that we did and that informed us a lot of things. And one of the things that this study informed us is how these skills now are defined in our context. So um, what you're seeing right now is um, how the, uh, the skills that the, the three skills and the one value that you chose and the, um, the end definition that came out and also we borrowed from, from the global definitions. So from problem solving, um, we ended up with a definition saying problem solving is the process of defining a problem, determining the cause of the problem, finding solution and apply the solution to the defined problem. Self-awareness ended up to be the ability to recognize, express, assess and manage emotions and feelings from one own perspective, but also uh, from the perspective of others. Respect ended um, up to be defined at the sense of what and value that one attaches to self someone else or something. And collaboration um, was defined as the process where two or more people come together on a common task to realize a shared goal. So from, from this definition and the study, because the study was other information that had informed us, when you're talking about problem solving in the context of East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, this can be like a big, one big thing, but it can be broken into so several uh, pieces. Because if I say the voter has problem solving, what do I mean? What is it that we can see? So we were able to create a skill structure that had um, broke uh, that broke the, the 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 skill into several pieces, and this allowed us to come up with a tool that. Um, could really be measuring what we are, we are looking for. So for example, you're seeing the skill structure for problem solving, and it has like three big dimension from the information that we gathered. And the first dimension is defining the problem. So for a person to be able to solve the problem or to have these skills, they have to first be able to define what is this problem. But then after that, they should be able to find the solution to that problem, and lastly, apply the solution. There are things that we wanted to understand. How do I know this person has been able to uh, define the problem? And there, we, we even broke down the, the, the dimension into several sub-skills, which was recognizing the problem for defining the problem, information gathering, and understanding the problem. And then for finding solution, we broke it down into exploring alternative solutions, reflecting on consequences, and selecting the solution. Finding solution, implementing the solution, and also understand from this skill structure you're seeing here is that we weren't able to measure, we weren't able to assess everything that you see. So the things that you see in green, except for the one C one. All of those things you see in green are the things that we ended up measuring, but we weren't able to measure applying on the solution because uh, our, our problems that we created were like abstract problem where we put a kid in a scenario where there's a problem and then we try to take them through the process on how they'll solve it. So uh, for example, one of the, of the, of the um, um, task was like, so you can really bring the implementing the solution, verify the solution. Um, 
Now, um, we chose to, to go with scenario-based tasks and uh, performance-based tasks. And the reason why we went to scenario-based tasks, which we did we went for- to uh, this. Excuse me? Okay. So um, we went uh, ahead and our tool had um, scenario-based tasks, which we use scenario-based for measuring uh, self-awareness respect. And then we use performance-based uh, tasks to measure collaboration. So for the scenario-based task, we chose them because they are context relevant. Everybody could really be de uh, dealing with, could understand, relate to, to the task. They're easy to adapt because our range, our age group was like 13 to 17. So um, it was easy for all the age group in, in that bracket to adapt to the tasks, but it was feasible. It was not, it's something that is available in our community and we could, we could afford. We didn't need a, a large investment of resources. They were simple when you administer the scenario base, uh, they're really, really simple, but also they're valid and reliable. So they reduced bias, but also they, we were sure that they were consistent in measuring what we wanted to measure. Um, so this is a sample of a scenario-based task, which is self-awareness, and it was in a community kind of a, a context. So uh, the task says you are walking along the street or road with your friends. Suddenly, a familiar age mate, boy or girl, pushes you over and start to make fun of you. Your friend also laugh. Uh, your friends also laugh at you for being pushed. So we put an adolescent in this scenario and now we try to ask follow-up questions that could allow him to um you know show how they react and so we measured um the the um things that were coming out in terms of um you know how is he uh how is he or she able to manage their emotions how are they able to look at different perspectives and things of that kind um when we are doing scenario based uh tasks we, it wasn't like easy. So we faced a couple of challenges and here I'm going to share very few challenges that we, share, we, we faced. And the first one is like just as purity as you know, mentioned earlier. And so when we are done um, creating the, um, the tool, we had to translate that to more than 20 uh, languages. So that, and also at the same time, we had to make sure that you are keeping the same, the tasks similar and, you know, um, to all the adolescents that would be uh, taking the test, because by comparing the whole, uh, so that was a little bit of a challenge because it took time and we, we needed to do a lot of back and uh, back to 13 to 17 from a 17 year, year old. Make sure that we are able to create tasks that are more relevant to the whole uh, age bracket so that they're not easy, too easy for the 17 year old or too difficult for the 13 year olds. But the best to overcome was to just recognize like when you're, you're getting responses, which ones are like, you know, cognitive and, you know, which ones are like, you know, really non-cognitive like this, uh, because we are measure, measuring non-cognitive. So which ones are really, um, are these um, scholars using their non-cognitive side? But also to elicit emotions ethically. So you want to get, the adolescent to be angry, but then how do you that, that do you do that in an ethical manner was a challenge, but you managed to really uh, uh, work on that. As I said earlier, we use performance-based tasks for collaboration skill. And why we use this? Because they are context relevant. Um, but also they're valid and reliable, they're ideal to assess life skills. You cannot ask, um, you know, um, paper-based um, tasks for testing collaboration. You need to see if these uh, adolescents are able, 
and really able to um, collaborate. So this was a really performance-based task we are really, really relevant into testing that. But we faced uh, some of the disadvantages with that was like the resource intensive and time consuming. So for example, when we are asking the uh, adolescent to perform these tasks, sometimes they get into the task too, task too much. And they, for example, there's a task of making a ball. So you find that they want to make a ball, they want to keep on doing it, they want to start playing with the ball, which really took so much time. And to manage that was a little bit of a challenge, but also they are really complex to score because because uh, you know, um, they are done by observation, and we had to make sure that we train our assessors to make sure that they're able to really uh, assess. assess. So this is the sample of the performance this task. And um, it's a, uh, as a group, they had to discuss and agree on available materials that went and collect the materials and there are things that we are assessing when they were doing that. And when they had the material, we asked them to sit down now and start. Um, making the ball. So for us, the, the, the actual ball wasn't um, the center of attention, but what we were interested in is the whole process that they do, for example, starting from how do they do communicate, how do they think, how do they we had assessors where one would read out loud the, 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 the scenario and then uh, the adolescent will respond, but then the other will, take, will listen and take note of the responses. For the performance-based task, we had one assessor as, uh, as, uh, observing two adolescents. And so one will read out the task and then they go observe and listen and take notes and eventually come back and um, regroup. We also had, um, uh, we used, uh, the data was entered right there on the spot, but what we, we really uh, were keen on is for the two assessors to make sure that they uh, see the score before they finalize this. So this gave us um, reliability into all the data that we, we are collecting. So what have we learned throughout this process and the methodology that we need uh, with the Despite, despite the fact that this process was really long, very intensive, time fresh, but we have realized that when you have the relevance of that tool has to really to really um, be very relevant to that context. But also to come up with a context relevant tool, we have to accept that it takes time, it takes patience and a lot of repetition. You have to do it so many times uh, to be able to um, come up with a tool that is really measuring what you want to measure. Um, but also um, the age, language, cultural context also need to be considered. There's so much that needs to be considered for the context, uh, for you to have a context relevant um, assessment tool. But despite the fact that we really wanted to make sure that our tools are context, re uh, context relevant, we, uh, we learned that it is, it is also very, very important to bring the technical uh, aspect of it and balance that. Of course, I want a, a context related relevant and I want to measure these skills at a context level, uh, at a context related uh, level, but you have also to make, to make sure that you're paying attention to the technical part of the tool so that um, at the end of the day, you can be able to, anal uh, to do the analysis and come up with uh, a result that I really telling a, a story that is relevant. So I'm going to stop here and invite Mauro uh, to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 
Devotha. Thanks, everyone. Please, uh, Richard, let me know if my line is okay in case uh, I can switch off the um, the camera. It's just that uh, I have uh, some problems uh, with the connection. I'm not at my duty station. I'm okay. I'm... Is it fine now? Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm stepping in for my colleague that uh, has lost a, a dear one and uh, couldn't be with us today. Um, so forgive me because I, I'm not a, a psychometrician, so I might say some things not so much um, uh, accurate as I, I'm supposed to, to be, but uh, I will try my best. So as uh, Purity has anticip anticipated, um, the assessment uh, was uh, done in uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and uh, it reached out to a total of 45,442 adolescents from uh, over 35,000 households. And uh, we employed uh, over 1,991 uh, 1, enumerators um, across the three countries. And uh, um, one thing that uh, Purity also had mentioned was our interest in being sure that even the enumerators were as much as possible close to the people uh, that we were um, going to assess. And so we hired enumerators and we trained enumerators from the areas uh, where, uh, that, that were coming from the areas that were part of the assessment. And we translated uh, into various languages uh, um, the, the tool. In terms of a construct, uh, we have uh, uh, assessed the collaboration, problem solving, self-awareness and respect. And for each one of these skills, uh, we have selected uh, some sub-skills that, that we went to assess uh, in order to have not only a number of items that was uh, big enough to give us uh, the power, statistical power to verify whether the, 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 the tool was actually measuring the skill. But at the same time, we were trying to cover more than one sub-dimension or sub-skills in order to be sure that um, we were trying to give also space to the depth of the skill. We have learned that uh, a skill is not uh, one block, but it is uh, kind of uh, made up of a number of uh, sub-skills. Um, Reporting to, according to one of the challenges that we first faced in terms of uh, uh, reporting was uh, the fact that um, if we say that in this test uh, the children have 37% uh, of problem solving skills, uh, it doesn't mean much. And uh, if uh, we wanted to define the level of uh, proficiency in problem solving of a student, uh, we cannot even say that uh, uh, the, 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 the skills uh, that uh, we are uh, measuring is uh, the problem solving of that student is good at uh, 37%. So there is a problem of understanding how to report about the skill since it is a sort of uh, um, continuum and made up of different uh, uh, aspects. And we decided uh, to report according to the proficiency level. But at the same time, uh, there was no standard uh, uh, recognition of what level of proficiency was reasonable to expect uh, across the ages or the education grades of the students that were involved the adolescents that were involved in this uh, test. And so even we were not having this kind of standard against which uh, to, to build the report. So in order to um, report the, 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 the levels of these skills, we um, opted for uh, uh, a developmental progression that uh, was describing what the adolescents were able to do and uh, in this way, we, um, we establish the ranges of proficiencies. So for problem solving, we used the RASH model, the IRT model. And uh, uh, we first mapped at a national level first, and then at a regional level, 
the performance of the, the adolescents in the different items. The graph that you see here at uh, the lower uh, right side shows how the different items, how the students, the adolescents were performing in the different items and of course also their distribution. Um, we could identify it quite clearly uh, across the three countries a pattern in terms of performance. And this is uh, uh, showing uh, how, how well uh, uh, somehow performing is uh, this uh, tool. Because across even this different context, uh, the performances, while they were slightly different in terms of uh, level of performance, but the, 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 the movement, let's say, of the performance and uh, the performance in the different uh, um, items uh, was uh, quite uh, parallel, quite similar from one uh, country to the next. And so we could divide somehow the uh, level of proficiency of problem solving into four main uh, um, levels, uh, four main categories somehow. And we describe these categories at level one, which is the lower side of the graph that you see on the, on the right side of the screen. We have students who are struggling to recognize a problem or its nature, and therefore that they were also unable to identify possible solutions. Level two instead describe, describes the students who are able to recognize the existence of the problems, but only from one perspective. They were capable of describing the problem only from one perspective. And um, they could act to identify a possible uh, solution only from that perspective. Instead, level three, the students were able to recognize the existence of a problem from one perspective, but uh, they were able to identify a main approach to solve the problem and justify it. On the level fourth, the students are aware of the existence of the problem from multiple perspectives, and they have even multiple solutions on, uh, across which they can select from. Similarly, for self-awareness, we had to divide the self-awareness into two main um, somehow subgroups, the one of perspective taking and the one of self-management. And we had the three different levels. On the first level, the students were unable to recognize and control their own emotions. And uh, uh, sorry, the adolescents were unable to uh, recognize and control their own emotions. And they were un unaware of how other they might feel. On the second level, they were able to control uh, their own emotion uh, and reaction and had some insight into how others might see the situation. And the third level, they were able to regulate their own emotions and reactions, and they were aware of the multiple ways that others might perceive and react to the situation. We uh, applied a similar strategy even for respect. In the first level, they were unable to respond in a relevant way. The second level, they were aware of the infringement of rights or bad behaviors. On the third level, they were able to interpret bad behaviors a lack of respect for others or for themselves. And they could take some consideratory steps to resolve the solution, the situations. Instead, at the fourth level, they are aware of the links between respect for property and respect for the person and act in a respectful way, in a respectful respect way towards others and the kind of others and for the same. In terms of collaboration, um, we have four levels. In the first level, the, the, the people are not able to engage uh, or being attentive even to the discussion that is going on uh, among the four people that were involved in the, in the task. And uh, they, in the second case, they were attentive, but quite quiet. They were not participating really. Um, in the third level, they were engaging uh, actively, but uh, they were not uh, capable of uh, um, being attentive to the inputs of the other and solicit the inputs of the others. So this one is the performance that we found across the region. Um, for problem solving, we have only uh, the 18 percent of the adolescents assessed that were between level three and level four. 
In the self-awareness, uh, we have only 17% that were in level three. The respect, uh, we have even in this case, only 50, uh, 8% that were in level four, 50% in level three. Hey, I remind you that uh, the 8% the is the ones that are even taking step in defense of the others, not only recognizing that maybe the others were having some problems. In collaboration, we have only 80% of the uh, adolescents that uh, were um, taking uh, positions that were participating and at the same time they were even attentive uh, to the inputs of the others. Of course, uh, having uh, over 1,100 uh, uh, assessors uh, in it's, it's uh, um, a possible limitation uh, to this study, even in terms of um, integrated reliability, but uh, we tried to, to uh, uh, somehow um, uh, limit this possible bias by having two assessors uh, assessing the same, the same um, adolescent. And, uh, but the positive thing of this uh, method is that the assessors were coming from the community from which the, the, um, mm -hmm. Um, the adolescents were, and so they could speak their language, they could interact very freely with them. Um, the other issue for future reflection and for more reflection is linked to the fact that the adolescents can get very familiar with this kind of assessment tool and assessment protocols, and so we need to ask ourselves what do we have to do in order to make it a little bit less familiar in case we wanted to have a pre-post or pre-intermediate and post assessment. And then um, there are issues linked to the language of administration and to the translation as much as one can be can, can do the back-to-back -back translation. There are so much so many nuances that can change a little bit the, the, uh, the impact and at the same time, there is always the problem that there is the risk of assessing the language proficiency and the language comprehension more than assessing the actual ability of the child to uh, engage in the in the scenario or in the tasks that are proposed to them. And then uh, there is always another thing that uh, not always is possible to 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 keep con to have under control. That is uh, the issue of the environment. Uh, uh, that is uh, surrounding the adolescents while even performing the assessment. Uh, sometimes we manage to be somehow far from uh, the, um, the, the parent or far from the relative that was uh, with us uh, during the assessment. Other times uh, it was a little bit more difficult to have a relative take distance and this could have impacted on the adolescents. I think that that's all I give back the floor to purity before the Q&A session. Um, thank you, Mauro. Um, I think I'll just finish up this last part and then I see there's so many questions coming up on the chat Then you have, uh, I think, sometimes to um, respond to the questions. So um, I'd like to invite everybody who is here and you invite your friends to our, our Valley Conference that is coming in in the next three months. So we'll have this conference um, in June. Uh, 21st to 23rd and to be happening in Nairobi and the purpose of this conference is to just make to create a platform where you know stakeholders who really um, work in this um, area of social emotional learning 21st century skills life skills you call it all these names come together to deepen the understanding um, on how like these uh, um, these uh, competences are uh, defined and understood in the context and why is it so important to really relate these competences into the contents, but also we want to learn uh, together how, what are the different approaches that can be used to, to assess these competences and um, how can we use the assessment now that and the information that we're getting, for example, what you're learning from my life to stimulate the uh, change on how, you know, how we do nurture the skills, how do we do, how do we, um, you know, making sure that our education system are really responding into making sure that these kids, uh, the learners are really also equipped with these skills that are not cognitive. But also, um, 
um, we have three main themes of the of the of the conference. The first one is the role of assessment and evidence in, to stimulate change. I've just talked a little bit about that, but also we want to learn about approaches in enhancing values and life skills among children and across the context. So we're going to have presenters from uh, different places. We are going to have. Uh, uh, people from the Curriculum Institute from Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, but also we're going to have people from non-profit organization who are implementing different um, uh, 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 programs in nurturing uh, values and life skills. And we want to come together and learn which, which are the best approaches to do this. But also we want to go to the third theme, which is education policy evaluation and its effectiveness in mainstreaming values and life skills. And if you want to learn more about how you can participate, you can go to our website in Rally Africa, but also we have, you can send uh, us a direct uh, email and I'll share the email. The, the one you're seeing there <laughs> is not correct. So I'll share the email on the chat where you can just send your inquiries about attending the conference and uh, we shall be able to um, share all the details with you. So the link for the registration is going to be out uh, toward the end of this week. And we encourage those who are interested to really apply and come, we learn together. Thank you, Rachel. I'd like to bring it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Devota. And um, yeah, there's just, so much to say about this presentation. I, I just want to, to note that a good indicator of how important this topic is, is how many participants we have in this session, which is 90 at the moment. Um, and we had over 200 register. And I can just see from all the comments in the chat um, how much um, this topic and, and your learning has resonated with everyone. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming through now, which is fantastic. Um, Purity, would you like me to select some of the questions um, for your team to address? I also know that some of your colleagues have, have joined as well, who might be able to, to speak um, a little bit more to these questions. I can see Khadija is here as well. Um, yes, what, how would you, would you like to proceed with the Q&A, Purity? Yeah, I think that, that, that's, that's fine, Rachel, and as you try to pick one, I could respond to how we, we are prioritized the, the various competencies. First is we did a very rigorous analysis of the education system and what um, our competencies are prioritized. You know, like in Kenya, we have the new competence-based curriculum that has already seven core competencies. And, and, and in Uganda, there are also some competencies that are prioritized by the system. Uh, you know, by the national curricula and also the Tanzania, but also our rally members, as I mentioned, that this is a project of the Regional Education Learning Initiative. So there are 70 organizations that are also working in various, um, to support education in different ways. And, and they are either using mentorship to nurture values and life skills, and they have prioritized certain uh, life skills and values. And that is our, that was our starting point, you know, bringing people, bringing all these documents together that are synthesizing them, but also comparing on when they when you have problem solving prioritized and in other, another country decision making creativity and imagination and just trying to bring all this together and asking uh, those hard questions. Is it critical thinking? Is it problem solving? But all in all, the government, uh, the national curriculum were, were mainly the first thing. And, and we didn't have a problem because we realized that we are so united. I think East Africa is for sure one and the same because the only one that we struggled with was self-awareness because like in Kenya, we talk about self-efficacy. Um, I know there are, there's a country, they talk about self-concept, self-identity. And, and so that was the only part where we really had to ask ourselves, which of these really hold all the others together? So is it self-efficacy? Is it self-awareness? And so the literature also came into play to support us in making decision. But the others, in terms of values, respect is one of the values that really hold not just um, East Africa, but I, I would say the African uh, context, uh, most of the people, even in our organization, one of the core values is respect. And so it was easy to pick that. So it was guided really uh, by a lot of, or a lot of studies. 
Uh, but as I, as I mentioned that one of them really, we needed to, to really ask ourselves the hard question, even uh, doing more deeper analysis uh, on the same and also asking ourselves uh, which one holds the others together. Yeah. Great, thanks Purity. Um, I think there's a question that I'm particularly interested in hearing the answer to as well. Um, I think it's about around the sort of um, how others might take up these assessment tools to use in their own work. So it's fantastic to hear that these tools will be open source. I guess my personal question, and I'll link it to Matt's question as well. My question is, um, you know, what kind of training might be needed for, for organizations to be able to use these tools? Is it something that you imagine um, they can read the guide, uh, a sort of guidance that comes with it and be able to, to conduct the assessment? And then a sort of secondary part of that question is um, Matt's, Matt French um, asked, wondering about the feasibility for partners um, and understanding that each student assessment takes around 30 minutes. Um, if you're assessing 2000 students, that's a thousand hours at baseline, a thousand hours at end line. Um, for organizations that have smaller budgets and smaller M&E teams, is that something that's feasible? And then yeah, I will, in, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. I don't know whether uh, John, you'd want to pick this up, but, but, but what we have seen, especially in our context, is there is now a, a growing um, feeling of how you, one, everybody wants to support education in different way. And I don't know uh, whether this is happening in other countries. We have people, young, young people adopting a village, you know, like saying, this is my village, I want to support in education. And so most of our most of the things I would say, of course, it is. It might be expensive to invest uh, on people who can collect the data. But then, if you are able to build that momentum for youth who probably would not be doing something else or want to give back to their communities, and we have seen this uh, growing uh, will from young people to support education in different spaces. But allow me to mention that for for our case, we really wanted to invest more also on having uh, people in the education space collect data. So it was a model where uh, we really uh, had teachers who are youth who are being trained to be teachers uh, doing the data collection. Why was this important? It's because we know these are the people who will get out there and, and work on nurturing our children. And so we wanted also to build their research capacity to support them in understanding, to have a deeper understanding of these core competencies because you can't really give what you don't have. So I think there is a two, a balance of, of really uh, uh, trying to help to build a learning community of youth who are interested in, in supporting education. Of course, it requires a lot of us creating awareness, but also uh, encouraging young people to know that um, the problem that we are facing now, we could be the solution. In terms of um, using the tool and the trainings, we, are, we will have a very, the documents might be very self-explanatory, but also alive we will have of, we love our trainings like these ones, you know, organizing learning sessions where people will be invited to learn more about uh, what is the process. If you want to use the tool, uh, the rubric, how to actually even analyze the data, which I think is one of the hardest parts. Analyzing and not just remaining with the statistics, making meaning, you know, the right maps that Mauro was, was really presenting. Uh, so we will offer support for some time, but through the learning sessions and, and encouraging people to keep on following our our learning sessions so it's where we can all come together and discuss some of these things. But I don't know what um, Mauro John Khadija could add to that. Yeah, Purity, one thing about the open source tool, we are also going to try to have like videos that are explaining on how to use the tool, how to do analysis, and you know, like a comprehensive you know, uh, self-teaching kind of um, a, a, a documentary where people can go and learn and practice. And when we'll have a Q&A a session where people can, you know, send their questions and answer so that, because we know like if there's so many people wanting to use this tool, we can't provide the trainings in all these other ways of how to train people and how to use the, um, the, the, the tool. 
Yeah, great, Devota. I think that's something that we face at INEE, right? Because all of our tools and resources are open source and we're like, here you go, use them. Um, but yeah, having that kind of feedback loop or an opportunity to um, ask for additional guidance is always important. And just to say to the Alive team, you know, as, when it comes to the point of launching the tools open source, we can we can do something within the INEE community as well. Um, just having a look through some other questions. I see that Kirti been answering some in the chat anyway. Um, I think a question from Nathaniel just came through. This is a question uh, for Devota. Um, now after the assessment, what's the next step as far as curriculum designing and development is concerned, keeping in mind these, these skills need to be taught in schools? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. And uh, so now that we have <laughs> we have all this uh, information, we are going to the second phase of um, the program of a life. And our next phase will be really focusing on, you know, how do we now support or work together with the Curriculum Institute from Kenya, Tanzania Uga uh, and Uganda to see how they can integrate like the assessment tool into the into the classroom. So we are moving to younger, uh, you know, younger um, kids from six to 12, but then we are moving from household to a classroom, um, you know, um, uh, development of, uh, to develop a tool that can be used in a classroom. And this will be done, uh, you know, uh, together with the curriculum institutes from, from our countries. But also we want to also expand the program and uh, to uh, keep on building on the capacity of uh, of uh, the technical capacity of the 47 people but also any um uh, adding more people that who can do this kind of assessment and um we also want to build on the learning that we'll be learning throughout this process throughout so that people can come and learn from the lessons that we have learned and that goes like building on um you know more um skills and you know more competences for you know for the whole uh country. I hope I've answered that. Yeah. Great. And I think, yeah, I think it's like um, an interesting place to start with with um, the design of the assessment and the measurement, and then using that to inform maybe the framework development, because of, often it also happens the other way around, right? A, a framework is developed, but then you kind of <laughs> reach an impasse about how you're going to measure these skills. Um, so to inform the other way around is, is you know, brilliant, <laughs> much more useful potentially. Um, I'm just checking the chat for some other comments. Um, Fatuma says, um, is it a comment or a question? I'm going to read out your comment anyway. Um, very timely. Whereas we recognize the limitations of the tools, I still find that with Alive tools, we're in a very good um place to start given it's the first time ever that uh, assessment of life skills is being brought for in East Africa, coupled with all the wins that accrue for, for nurturing the process. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And um, question from Samuel, how would it require to support our 47 experts to come up with tools for other competencies? Could this be done without necessarily going through all the steps that the team went through? Is there a shortcut? I guess is the question. <laughs> I mean, for my opinion, I've been into the technical team. I'm one among the 47. So now I know, like, when I want to come up with an assessment, you know, um, uh, tool, like, what are the procedures to be followed and things of that kind. So for me, I only need more, uh, you know, um, you know, um, more knowledge about like, you know, the analysis and, you know, how to test my tasks and things of that kind. So it's just building on the knowledge, but actually the, 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 the foundation knowledge is there. So uh, this, the continuation will be like just building on the knowledge that is already there, I hope, you know, but we don't have to go through like, you know, what we have been through because the, the tool development process took about 10 months. So we don't have 10, we don't need 10 months to do that. I'm sure that's a relief to everyone <laughs> to hear that. So we are just at time. Um, and I want to thank absolutely everyone for their involvement today, for participants for coming, engaging, for all your questions. And a huge, huge thanks to the Alive team for sharing again um, all your findings and 
and bringing us with you on this on this journey. There's so much to be learned. When we share the recording, we'll share the slides and also link to the Alive reports, um, which are available to read. So you can look at um, all these studies in, in a little bit more detail. Um, just finally, I want to share um, a short evaluation form and I will share it as well in the, the follow-up email. Just the briefest, just, just even three questions. It's so short. Um, if you could quickly fill this out, it really helps the Alive team um, planning their next uh, webinar, their next uh, learn shop. So if you could just take a couple of minutes um, to fill that out, we'd be really, really grateful. Thank you everyone. And um, we'll see you again for another INE event and um, do keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks.